to be back at home today. Thank you all for giving us the privilege to sing. We're a little handicapped. Uh, Connie on vocal rest, and, uh, and Carol's going to try to sing her part on a song that I wanted Mr. Reuben to sing because of the adversity we faced this past weekend. But all of the goodness of God reminded me who I am in Christ, and I'm overwhelmed, believe me. I, I am somebody in Christ. Bible says all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. I believe it was meant for them to start all over. And the reason I believe that is because the first part of that song is so important for us to listen to. I'm glad this morning that I know that I am His and He is mine. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Amen. We're something in Him. Outside of Him, we're nothing. But in Him, we're something. We're children of the King. I want to share with you today out of Deuteronomy chapter 1 and uh, also in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14. De Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 26, and then Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14. And I'll read that in just a few minutes, but I've got a, a couple of quick announcements that I need to make. Uh, I'd like to announce that uh, Glenda McDonald is no longer Glenda McDonald. She is now Glenda Roby, she's married to Robert, and he's with her this morning. They got married yesterday, and uh, they're going to be leaving 
This is her last service with us. They're going to Texas. That's where they're going to uh, live at. <clears throat> Excuse me, but uh, she asked me to express to everyone at Batley that she has enjoyed being a part of this church and has been richly blessed. Uh, she appreciates those that have become her friends, and she loves each and every one. Uh, she'd like to express her appreciation to me for my faithfulness to the Lord during these last two years fighting uh, my battle with cancer and my messages. Uh, has blessed her soul, she said, encouraged her to keep on keeping on. She also expresses her appreciation to Chad uh, and also to Brother Lee for their anointed messages and faithfulness to Batley Baptist Church. And finally, uh, she said, it's been a real blessing and a great honor to be a part of the Batley Choir. And to Connie Fortner, she'd like to say that she's the best. And would we, let's just give her a hand this morning as... Uh, she enters this new phase in her life. Why don't you and your new husband stand so everybody know who I'm talking about this morning? Amen. You can be seated. Very quickly, we have a very important Sunday school meeting on August the 15th. Uh, you need to be there. If you can't be there, uh, let, uh, let us know and uh, let us know the reason because it's, it's a very important meeting. I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit along with Brother Eric, uh, got a very exciting news that I want to share with you. On September the 8th, in the morning and evening service, we're going to have Don Pearson with us. He's the prior strategist for the state of Tennessee, and uh, you've never heard anybody like him. He is uh, completely different uh, than anybody that I've ever heard, and such conviction just sweeps through a congregation when he speaks, and I want you to be there uh, Cancel all your plans right now. If you're going somewhere, go sometime else. You need to be here that morning and that evening. And also, I want to say this. He's normally a little bit longer than I am. And we're going to try to give him a little bit more time during that service. But come prepared to stay a little bit longer. Uh, sometimes we get in such a hurry that we leave God out of what he wants to do. And so uh, just uh, come prepared to stay for that. Uh, another exciting announcement that I want to make, we're going to have a tent revival here. Uh, that's on October the 7th, and that'll run through the 10th. Uh, men's conference at Beach Park, that's next week, the 16th and 17th. If you would like to go, you need to tell me today. Uh, in fact, let me just say this. Don't tell me, tell Kathy. Kathy, stand up so they'll know who I'm talking about. You go to Kathy and let her know that you want to go, and we'll make sure that you get uh, the tickets that you need. If they're still available, they're $25. And that includes supper, and that includes uh, breakfast the next morning. Uh, Johnny Hutt will be uh, preaching, and uh, I meant to bring the paper, but there's a, a, a quarterback uh, that uh, for the NFL that's going to be speaking. Bob Record will be speaking. It's going to be a good conference. Uh, I've, I've said enough. Uh, Lonnie asked me a few minutes ago, he said, is there any request that you have for an invitation song? And I told him, I said, the message that I'm going to preach, I, I can't think of anything. It's not going to be on heaven this morning. Uh, so I want you to go ahead and fasten your seatbelts. Uh, I'm going to read the scripture to you in just a few minutes. But I, I don't want to bore you with a story about the battle that I've been in. All of you, or most of you are well aware that I've been battling cancer uh, for the last two years. But it's a wonderful illustration uh, as to what I want to share with you from God's Word. I, I didn't realize that I had cancer in my body until they took a needle and extracted fluid from my abdomen, and then I discovered that I had cancer on all of my organs. Uh, last year, on, in the month of March, I had surgery. Uh, after taking chemo for six months, it almost killed me. And I had surgery. They removed 10 pounds of tumor, and... Uh, after that, six months later, I went to Wake Forest. They did the surgery again. They scraped all of my organs and put uh, chemo internally inside of me for the last two hours of my surgery. Uh, so I've been battling this, but I said all that to say this. Cancer is a disease that attacks the good cells in the body. And, and uh, sometimes a person will literally be destroyed before they ever discover that they have cancer. Sometimes they find out and it's too late. It's destroyed too many good cells, destroyed too many good organs in their body, and there's no hope for them. 
This morning, I want to share with you uh, something about cancer. You know, there's hundreds of variations and types of cancer. Some cancer grows very fast. Some grows very slow. In my case, I'm thankful it grows slow. They said that my cancer had probably been growing for five to ten years inside of my body, and I'm thankful that it was a slow-growing cancer. But I don't want to talk about me anymore. I want to talk about the body of Christ. And I want to talk to you about a spiritual cancer that can destroy the body. And there's not a church in America that is immune. Many of you that sit here in these pews this morning have come from churches that uh, have been destroyed by the kind of cancer that I'm going to share with you in just a few minutes. It's very important that we check ourselves. The Bible says to examine ourselves. It's a good idea to go to the great physician. You know, every three months, in fact, in just about a week and a half, I'll go back and I'll have a CAT scan. And they'll do their best to look inside my body to see if that cancer is is growing again. And if it is, why, they'll come up with a plan of attack to try to keep it from destroying the good cells within my body. The Bible talks about we as the body of Christ. Paul says in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 5 that we being many are one body in Christ and everyone members one of another. Saying that, you and I need to keep a good check on ourselves or better yet... We need to take a biopsy of our heart and allow the great physician to put it under the microscope of his omniscience and see whether or not we have been affected by this disease of cancer, this spiritual disease. The cancer that I'm talking about, now this is where you really need to pull tight on the straps of your seatbelt and make sure that you're strapped in Because I'm going to preach to you today about the cancer of complaining. It destroys bodies of Christ. And so let's look in God's Word together. In Deuteronomy chapter number 1, beginning with verse 26, and we'll read down through verse number 38. Would you stand with me? Take off your seatbelt for a minute. Stand with me. Let's look in God's Word together. This is after Moses had sent the spies out into the land. They came back and said, the land is flowing with milk and honey. There's grapes that are so big that it took two men to take a cluster of grapes between them on stage to carry them. It's a land of walled cities. And yet, out of those 12 men that went... Only two men came back saying, we can take it because God said we could. The other ten brought back a very negative report. They said, there's giants in the land. And so that's where we pick up this morning. Notwithstanding, you would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. And you murmured in your tents and said, because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the land of the Amorites, to destroy us. Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people is taller and greater than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakim there. Then I said unto them, Dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God, which goeth before you, he shall fight for you according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes, and in the wilderness where thou hast seen how the Lord thy God bare thee as a man doth bear his son in all the way that you went until you came into this place. Yet in this thing you did not believe the Lord your God, who went in the way before you to search out a place, to pitch your tents in, in fire by night, to show you by what way you should go, and in a cloud by day. And the Lord heard the voice of your words, and was wrought, he was angry, and swear, saying, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which I swear to give unto your father, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. He shall see it, and to him will I give the land because, that he hath trodden upon, and to his children, because he hath wholly followed the Lord. And the Lord was angry with you for your sake, saying, Thou also shall not go in thither. 
Joshua the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither, encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 14. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Philippi and he says, Do all things without murmurings and disputings. You can be seated this morning. We are the body of Christ. There is an enemy of the body. I call it the cancer of complaining. A lot of churches that used to be on fire for God used to be very vibrant. They have been destroyed by this disease. I thought about, about a man that joined a monastery and his lifelong dream was to be a monk. He went to the head monk of the monastery and he said, I'd like to join. And the head monk said, brother, said it's a lot harder than what you think. He said, every year we just allow you to say two words. And you have to vow, vow of silence the rest of the time. At the end of the first year, we'll allow you to say, say two words. And at the end of every year, you're allowed to say two words. The man said, that sounds a little bit extreme. He said, but I'm going to give it a try. And so he stayed in the monastery for the first year. And the head monk came to him at the end of that year. And he said, what would you like to say? And he said, food bad. Stayed another year at the end of the second year. He went before the head monk and he said, what would you like to say? And he said, bed hard. At the end of the third year, the head monk said to him, now, what two words now would you like to say? And he said, I quit. And the head monk said, you might as well quit. All you've done since you've been here is complain anyhow. <laughs> well, this morning, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he serves up a very tall order for us. Do all things without murmuring and complaining. Murmuring means complaining. Do all things without disputings and murmuring. Doesn't he realize who we are? I mean, don't he know that we're Baptists and that we surely were born to complain? Now, if I understand the Scripture correctly, and I believe that I do, we're told to work without complaining, to serve without complaining, to give without complaining, to go without complaining. Everything that we do, we're to do it without complaining. That word, do all things without disputes and murmurings, that word murmurings means grumbling. You ever been around somebody like that? Has somebody... When it was just you and them been around somebody like that? I believe we all do that sometimes, don't we? We complain. That word murmuring, it means grumbling. I thought about when I was a kid, I, I loved to watch cartoons. And now that I'm a grandpa, I'm learning to love it again. But that word murmuring, it, it means grumbling. And I thought about my favorite cartoon when I was a boy was Hillbilly Bear. Anybody remember that? You can go on YouTube and find Hillbilly Bear. He's still on there. But his wife would get on to him, and she would ask him to do something, and you never really could understand what he said, but he would grumble. He would just say something like, rrr, 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 rrr. Reminds me of a group of Baptists that get together. He grumbled. I don't know about you, but... That verse in Philippians bothers me. Do all things without disputings and murmuring because sometimes I complain. I find myself complaining sometimes, and I really shouldn't because God has been so good to me. But I have to, uh, sometimes I have to repent of that. And I have to say, God, I'm sorry that I complained. I, I'm sorry that I saw the glass half full or half empty instead of seeing it half full. The truth of the matter is we have very little to complain about. Most of the time, it doesn't help a thing. In, in fact, I believe that when we complain, we hurt ourselves more and more. 
And so this morning, I want to look at the cancer of complaining. I want to first of all look at the reason for complaining. Again, verse 26 in Deuteronomy chapter 1, notwithstanding you would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. And you murmured in your tents and said, because, now notice this, because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our heart. By the way, that's what complaining does. It discourages yourself. It discourages others. The brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the signs of the Anakims there. They were on their way to the promised land. God had miraculously delivered them out of the land of Egypt. Moses, though, he's about to step off the scene, and Joshua's about to take his place. But he reminds them of their complaining. You see, the scripture that I read this morning, that wasn't the only time they complained. They were constantly complaining against God and the man of God. Oh, yes, they had been in the wilderness for 40 years, but God had been good to them. God had supplied their every need. The Bible says that God even made it so that their shoes didn't even wear out. Those uh, thousands of miles that they had trod, and their shoes still hadn't wore out. God gave them manna from heaven. He gave them water from the rock. God protected them from their enemies. And so the question that I believe needs to be answered this morning, why then did they complain so much? I believe, first of all, it was disobedience to the commandments of God. What did he say? Verse 26, you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord. Then we're told how they rebel in verse 27, and you murmured in your tents. In other words, when the family would get together, and you've got to realize it was always extended families, father, son, grandson, and they would gather together, and they complained. They murmured, and I believe the greatest sin that they committed is they murmured against God. And when they got outside their tents, they began to murmur with the neighbor that lived in the tent next to them until finally that's all they was doing is just complaining. Can I say something this morning? Is they attacked the man of God. In reality, they was attacking God. And I want to say this, not because I'm your leader here, but it needs to be said, you better be very careful when you attack one of God's chosen. Better be very careful about that. You remember in the book of Acts, when Peter and John were brought before the Sanhedrin, and they brought in the smartest man that they knew, on that council, Gamaliel, and they ask him, Gamaliel, what's your opinion of this matter? I mean, they're preaching Jesus everywhere, and folks are following him. They're trusting him. What's your opinion? What should we do with Peter and John? They're causing a, a, a disruption among the people. And this was Gamaliel's advice. And I believe it's good advice in Acts chapter 5 and verse 34. He said, refrain from these men. In other words, leave them alone. You leave these men alone for this counsel or this work. If it be of men, it'll come to naught. But if it be of God, you can't overthrow it, lest happily you be found fighting against God himself. Folks, it's a dangerous thing. I know there's some men of God, uh, those that claim to be men of God, that are not what they claim to be. I understand that. But I tell you, put that in the hands of God and let God take care of it. Be very careful. The Bible says here, they murmured against Moses. I remember another time when they murmured against Moses. The Bible says Korah thought that he would take the position of the man of God. 
Dear friend, God answered him in a very terrible way. He opened up the earth and it swallowed Korah and his wife and his children. Dear friend, God killed them on the spot because they murmured against the man of God. It's a dangerous thing. Now, as the pastor of a church, a pastor has to, has to make a lot of decisions. And I'm going to tell you something. Go ahead and pull that belt just a little bit tight, tighter because this is going to shock you. I am not perfect. I can see how white some of your faces are getting. I'm not perfect. I'm just a man of like passion. I like those men of the Bible that messed up. I mess up. I've made some bad decisions. These times that instead of consulting God, I got ahead of God and I made decisions that I shouldn't make. By the way, the leaders that we have in this church, they're no different than me. They're not perfect. Connie's not perfect. She's a great choir director, but she is not perfect. Our youth pastor, Chad, is not perfect. He, he's, I believe he's doing the best he can, but he's going to make some mistakes along the way. And I tell you, before you start complaining about the leadership, look in the mirror. Because we all mess up, don't we? There's none good, no, not one. And so we see it was disobedience to the command of God. That was the reason for complaining. But it was also disrespect for the chosen of God. God chose Moses. Moses didn't just choose this leadership position. He didn't just decide this would be the vocation that he would enter into. God chose him. God set him apart to lead the children of Israel. Dear friend, they were guilty of disrespecting the chosen of God, they begin to complain against his leadership. And in doing so, they was really complaining against God. And they got themselves in a lot of trouble. Not every man that stands behind the pulpit is God's man. And I understand that. And I'll say this this morning. If I was in a church and there was a man that was in the pulpit that I knew wasn't the man of God... I, and things were not getting better, i just go ahead and slip out quietly, and I would allow God to find me a place where that there was a man of God that stood and preached the Word of God. That's my advice to you this morning. Oh, dear friend, they disrespected the chosen of God. Oh, complaining. You know, uh, sometimes it's just a reaction to tough circumstances. We look at our circumstances and we complain. We take our eyes off of God, and when we do, we begin to mumble, and we begin to gripe, and moan, and groan, and complain. You know one of my pet peeves, and I'm going to share it with this morning, is when somebody will come to me, and they'll say something like this. Now, preacher, this is not what I'm thinking, but you know you've got some members in the church that don't like what's going on. That just burns my hide. And they make it sound like they must be a hundred that are disgruntled. But in reality, what it turns out to be is one or two. But they're making a lot of racket. And they'll come to me and say, now, they, some people just don't like that. It's sort of like the fellow that couldn't sleep at night because he had a pond that he thought was full of frogs and they croaked all night. And he made up his mind, I'm going to get rid of them critters. And so he drained the pond, and to his surprise, there was just two frogs that was doing all the croaking. He thought it must have been a hundred. But I tell you, if you come to me and say, somebody just don't like what's going on, I'm going to ask you who the somebody is. And if you won't tell me who the somebody is, then just don't tell me to begin with. Because if a person doesn't have enough of the grace of God, if they've got a problem to be Christian enough to go ahead and let me know, preach, I've got a problem. Now, I'll listen to you if you think that you've got a problem, but I'm not going to take second-handed complaints. Amen. I just won't do it. Out west, a cowboy was going to the rodeo and 
In the back of his truck, he had his uh, trusted dog, and he had his prize horse in a trailer. He was pulling behind, went around a curve, and uh, went off the edge and wrecked the truck. And he was laying there, throwing him out, had a lot of broken bones, a lot of cuts, a lot of bruises. After a while, a state trooper came on the scene, and the state trooper just happened to be a man that loved animals. And he went over to the horse, and he saw that the horse had broke a couple of its legs, and he put the horse out of its misery, took out his gun, and he fired and put the horse out of its misery. Then he walked around a little farther, and he saw a dog that was uh, uh, whining because it too was wounded to the point it would never recover, and so took out that gun again. And he put the dog out of its misery. Went around to the cowboy that was laying there. Had several broken bones, cuts and bruises. And the cowboy had heard the sound of the gunshot. He saw the gun in the state trooper's hand. And the state trooper said to the cowboy, Buddy, how you doing? He said, I've never been better. (laughs) See, the reasons for complaining... It's disobedience to the commandment of God because do all things without disputings and murmurings. That's not a suggestion, that's a command. And then, it was disrespect for the chosen of God. They didn't like Moses. They thought, well, that uh, man, he can't even talk plain. And he says he's our leader. They disrespected the man of God. So we see the reason for complaining. What's the results of complaining? We think it's harmless because we do it so much. We think it's just a little harmless habit that we have. When I think of complaining, I will remind you, first of all, that complaining is contagious. You know, if you've got a negative attitude, when you get around other people, a lot of times they'll catch what you've got. It's like if I come in here and and I shook Brother Dizzy's hand, I hugged his neck, and he said to me, he said, how how you doing, Luke? And I said, well, I I, I think that I've got the flu. And I've been shaking his hand, hugging his neck. You know what Dean is going to do? He's going to rush out there and he's going to wash his hands and wash his face. But I guarantee you that most of the time, if I did that, even though he's not one bit sick, he'll sit there and think, you know, my throat's getting sore. I believe I might be getting what he's got. It's contagious. Complaining is contagious. In their tents, they complain. It spread all over the place. Let me just get real serious for a second here this morning. It's destroyed more churches than anything I know of. It'll destroy a congregation. We're the body of Christ, that cancer of complaining. It'll destroy us. And the more we complain... You know what the Bible says? If I've got a problem with Brother Jay, I should go to Brother Jay. I shouldn't go to Bobby. And say, you know what Jay did? Because Bobby, you know, he's a, he might go to somebody else and say, hey, did you hear what Brother Jay has done? You know, or what Brother Luke's done? And, and it'll spread. It's contagious. Folks, we've got a good church. We've got a church, I believe, that's in unity right now. So, preacher, why are you preaching that? I don't want to give the medicine after you're sick. I want to give you some vitamins to keep you from getting sick. I want to pass out the gospel this morning to everyone to help us. I tell you, the devil would love to destroy this body. He would love to get us to griping and complaining. To the point that we absolutely devoured one another. Paul cautions us about that. He talks about after that we have devoured one another, that we'll be consumed of one another. It's contagious. You hang around a negative person long enough, and the sky will be falling. The church, it won't be able to recover. In your mind, you'll be thinking, buddy, things are terrible. But can I remind you, it's probably just two old frogs that are croaking. (laughs) It's contagious. Let's keep a positive attitude and a positive outlook on life. And then I want to say this this morning, complaining is not only contagious, complaining is costly. It costs something. It's destroyed a lot of churches. 
churches that I've preached in used to preach a lot of revivals. And I've preached in churches that run two and three hundred people and, and packed the house and had the power of God rested upon them. And some of those same churches right now are in danger of padlocking their doors. And you know why? In a lot of cases, they absolutely made a mountain out of a molehill. Now, again, I want to say, if, if life's too short, if you're in a place where you can't worship, and it becomes a burden instead of a blessing. Life's too short. Find you a church where that you can enjoy the goodness of God and you can fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what you need to do. Don't stay around running the church down, running the pastor down. I don't know that anybody's doing that, but if they are, I just told on you. I don't think you are. I think, I think behind my back you talk uh, good things about me. I, I believe that. But I'm telling you, it's awful easy to get to the point where that we're complaining to the point that it destroys the body of Christ. Complaining is costly. Let's not allow ourselves, our homes, our churches to be destroyed with murmuring and disputing. Let's not allow that. Let's see this church grow. I tell you, we've got some empty pews here this morning. I know it's summertime, but I want to see it grow to the point to where that when we get back into the summer, we have to set chairs out. And we have to expand the auditorium. I just don't like big churches. How in the world do you think they got big? I mean, they loved one another. And they was excited. If you're excited about what's going on around here, you'll go out of here, and when you get to the food city, somebody will ask you, how'd the meeting go? And they didn't expect you to take 15 minutes of their time to tell you how glorious God came down and God blessed. And it'll grow a church when you are just excited about what Jesus is doing. It's costly. You know how costly it was for them? About two million people. About half or maybe over half. Those 20 years old and older. Moses said, you're going to die in the wilderness. You're never going to see the promised land. That was costly. Complaining is costly. Can you imagine how they felt? All the time knowing I'm not going to make it. I've been dreaming about the promised land. I thought about how good it's going to be to go to that land that's flowing with milk and honey. I, I wished I hadn't started complaining when those spies came back and said, there's giants in the land. I wished I'd have just believed God's word. I, I wished I'd have just went ahead and trusted that he said that we can take the land instead of being so negative. Oh, complaining can destroy a church. It can destroy a body. And then, last of all, we've seen the reason for complaining. We've seen the results of complaining. And I want you to notice the remedy for complaining. There's a remedy. By the way, sometimes I preach messages and I think, well, maybe I got a, about a third of the congregation because the other two-thirds, they probably don't need that right now. I tell you, when I preach this message, I could point five fingers on both hands in any direction at any person that's sitting in the pew, and everybody needs this message. Amen? Amen. Now, there's some folks that I don't believe ever complain, but they're rare and very few between. I see all them guilty faces looking at me as a guilty face up here looks back at you. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Just go ahead and say amen anyhow. You know I'm telling you the truth. The remedy for complaining, first of all, remember the blessings. Remember the blessings. Complaining has as its root unbelief. Just not trusting God to take care of situations. Let's face it. When we complain, it shows ingratitude. It shows that we have forgot what God has done for us. 
And dear friend, when we forget that, we can't do what the psalmist said in Psalms 104. We cannot enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. We can't do it when we're complaining. And we can't do what the psalmist said in Psalms chapter 150 and verse 6. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord because we get so consumed with complaining we don't have time to praise. It'll, it'll sour your attitude. And dear friend, I tell you what happens sometimes. It gets to the point that nobody wants to be around you. And I say that I am thankful. I tell you one of the things I just now thought of that I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for caller ID. Sometimes I'm just not around to answer the phone when I see the number. Amen? I could complain. I could complain about the disease I've got in my body. I could do that. I could complain about the daily pain that I have in my abdomen, about the times that I go to the doctor, I've got to go Monday, and they're going to stick me. And most of the time when they stick me, it takes four or five times. And sometimes even after that, they can't find a vein because it's been destroyed by chemotherapy. I could complain about that. I, I could let that ruin all the blessings that God has given to me. I could complain Dear friend, about the unending times that I have to go to the doctor. I could complain, but I have chosen to remember the blessings of God. I've chosen, dear friend, to remember those things. I've chosen to remember that I have time with my, my wonderful wife. I love that woman right there. And I am so glad that I still have my life that I can spend a little bit more time with my wife. And my boys, I get to do some things with my boys. And my grandkids. <laughs> I get to, little Addison, when she does come to my house, I, I get to have tea parties and play with dolls. <laughs> I could complain but I rejoice in the fact that I am still able to stand in this pulpit and preach you the Word of God. What a blessing that is. God, every day when I get up, may I remember this is a bonus day. Two years ago, I didn't think I'd be standing here this time this year on this day. I, I thought God was going to call me home. Now, I'm ready to go. Don't you misunderstand me. And I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus. But if I could just win one more soul, if I could just encourage one more person, dear friend, it'd make the journey so much sweeter. I'm going to spend eternity on the other side. God's given me a few more days to spend on this side. Oh, dear friend, you need to remember the blessings. One of the ways to do that, Philippians chapter 4, verse number 8. Finally, brother, and Paul says, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any praise, if there be any virtue, which means power, think on these things. I need to release the burden. Not just remember the blessing, but I need to release the burdens. Psalms 55 and 22, cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Release the burden. If your body suffers pain, and your health you can't regain. Your soul is almost sinking in despair. Jesus knows the pain you feel. He can save and he can heal. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Leave it there. Leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. If you trust and never doubt, he will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. 
when your enemies assail and your heart begins to fail. Don't forget that God in heaven answers prayer. He will make a way for you and lead you safely through. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Leave it there. Leave it there. That's the answer to complaining. Leave it there. Cast your burden upon the Lord and leave it there. Though we always will have some complaints. Some complaints are legitimate. But I tell you, dear friend, if we start complaining and we don't get a handle on it, it won't be long until it'll consume us. We'll give you some good advice this morning. Somebody comes to you and they start complaining about somebody else in this church. You sit there and you take that all in. You become a partaker of their sin. I tell you what you need to do. If they start complaining about somebody... If some comes to me, somebody comes to me about Dizzy Dean, I have no reason to sit there and listen to that all the time. I tell you what I normally do. I said, let me call Dizzy. And that's what I'm going to do. And so you understand that. If you come to me and you've got to complain against somebody, I'm going to pick up my telephone. And I've tried that a few times. And that's all, oh, no, preacher, don't do that. It's not that bad. Don't take your eyes off of Jesus. Take your eyes off of your circumstances. Turn your eyes toward him. That's the message. I don't know what he's going to. What kind of invitation are you going to give this morning? Song. Some folks need to come. Because it'll consume you. You need to come and talk it over with the Lord. You may need to go to somebody and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've been complaining and murmuring and grumbling, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry I did that. Somebody said, that would be so embarrassing. I would rather be embarrassed by going to somebody and say, hey, I, I'm sorry. Than I would to stand before the King of glory and him say, you know that you should have went to them and apologized. You know you should have done that. I'd rather be embarrassed before you as to be embarrassed before him. Amen? Let's stand. Let's sing this morning. <laughs>